Good afternoon to the Find Your Fire Tribe. It's another wonderful Fire Friday event. For those of you who haven't seen us before, I'm Wendy Yorching, founder of Healing Spaces Caribbean, and I am also known as the tribe mom of the Find Your Fire Tribe. And every Friday we host a interesting, fascinating, chi enhancing event for my tribe. And today's guest will be someone who I consider a very unique and special speaker. Now, I first heard of this gentleman because, as you all know, I love birds and I love hummingbirds. And many of you think I'm a bird whisperer because there's so many pictures and videos of me rescuing birds from my house and they don't want to leave me. And someone in the tribe connected me with this gentleman's Facebook page. And I realized that it was a hummingbird feast. He posts the most incredibly stunning images of hummingbirds on a daily basis. And then also many people share their amazing professional pictures, not like mine, on his site. So it's something that gives me joy on a daily basis when I see the pictures that are shown of hummingbirds that I didn't even know existed. So I went to him and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson, would you please come and talk to the tribe? And he said, yes, he would. And so I'm really pleased to introduce to you today, Dr. Theodore Ferguson who is an educator, a scientist, a world traveler, author of several books, and also the person who created and runs the Yeret, home of the hummingbirds, sanctuary in Trinidad. Many people in Trinidad recognize this as a wonderful place to experience the magic of hummingbirds and international visitors. Uh, uh, apparently, this, they, they all flock to Yeret and he, this sanctuary has become known as one of the, it's, it's acclaimed as one of the places with the biggest body of knowledge of hummingbirds. So I'm really pleased to welcome you, Dr. Theodore Ferguson, and I hope you don't mind me calling you Theo. And I love I'll give, that. You, I'll give you the floor now so that you can tell the tribe a little bit more about you and your journey to Yeret and what it means to you. And of course, we're looking forward to seeing your hummingbird pictures. Wow. Before I do that, let me make sure I put my household in order and to give credit to my wife. Yeret is a joint venture between the two of us. And if you've been here, you will know the fantastic meals that she prepare. And she's all, she's highly acclaimed, and then more acclaimed than me for our skills in that era. And also as a hostess. So now that I've taken care of that, I can oh. breathe and I can continue. Always wise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much for inviting me on this, to the strive. And I'm very curious, but well, we're not gonna go into that this afternoon to find out how you arrived at, at declaring yourself the mother of the strive, but I will get that later on. But unfortunately, the phone might ring in the background a little bit, but I can't do much about that right now. Well, you introduced me in the context of the right? And I'll stay with that. The right is a, I call it just simply a hummingbird attraction. But how did I find myself in this situation, because I didn't set about to create a right. I didn't set about to make a right happen. I've been on a journey, my life is a journey that has taken many twists and turns. And it's all about trying to serve humanity in the best way that I can. And searching for the best way to do that. And that led me first into the field of agriculture. And where I, that's where I got my PhD. But then I knew I had to do more. I enjoyed it, I enjoyed teaching. And then I moved on with a special interest in trying to understand the nature of the human being. 
And in trying to understand the nature of the human being, it took me a while to understand that I have to start with myself. Because the best laboratory I have, like we all have, about understanding humanity is about understanding. It first starts, starts firstly with ourselves. And I got there by accident, but I got there. And I went on a deep introspective journey that was absolutely revealing and that changed my life and introduced me to the whole world of the inner self and the importance of self-knowledge and helped me to concretize my purpose and my journey to finding my purpose and fine tuning that purpose, which I discovered is about people. But all of most of that happened in a distant continent, South Africa, an intensive period of introspective work for about a year and a half. But when I came back to Trinidad, I wanted to spend a lot of quiet time. And I was trying to get around fine to see how best can I do that. And I went back to something that I enjoyed doing as a kid, which was spending time in the bush. And I started spending time in the bush. And after a while, I realized I have to look as though I, I know what I'm about because you start looking like a, like a madman or crazy person just walking aimlessly in the bush in the forest. So I got a camera. <laughs> And if you have a camera and it started to look for things to photograph. And the birds got my attention. They're always moving around and they quickly drew my attention. Wow, and what a world I discovered. And I started photographing the birds. And next thing you know, I was upgrading my equipment, my photographic equipment. And I became an ardent bird photographer. photographer. And is the right nature center kind of became my second home. It's an amazing place to just go and sit in the sit in the bush, sit under the canopy of those massive trees they have there and just enjoy nature. And because nature is a powerful thing, and nature reminds you of who you are. Nature silences you. And you don't have to fight it because it helps you to find that inner silence and to give your inner voice a chance to speak to you and to speak to you very loudly. And that became a joy and I wanted to spend a lot of time, a lot more time out in the bush taking pictures, which was totally secondary. But to most people, it appeared to be primary. Because most people don't understand, I will tell you, the importance of quiet time. We are quick to conclude that the madman. In any case, I enjoyed it. And but in the meantime, photography developed. And Interesting things happened. My first book on photography came out, out of that exercise in which when the government commissioned me to prepare a gift for the heads of state who came in for the Summit of the Americas and the Commonwealth Heads of Government. That was quite an opportunity. And that was Trinidad and Tobago's gift to the heads of state who came in, a book I prepared. But while all of that was happening. The hummingbirds caught my attention. And I got closer to the hummingbirds and closer. And then the hummingbirds became a, a passion. Smallest birds in the world, the busiest birds in the world, the most challenging birds to photograph. You looking for a challenge in life? What a challenge. And I got into photography of hummingbirds. 
And that is what led to the establishment of Yeret. Because I was learning so much. And I wanted to learn more. And Yeret served a dual function of helping me to share with others what I understood about hummingbirds, helping me to share my photography while giving me a chance to interact with who is who in the world of hummingbirds from around the world. Because they all turned up, they all came to, towards the Eret. And Israelite, as a, the existence of Israelite was important in helping to make that happen. Because as a nature place is attracted, the best nature people from around the world. And it gave me, that gave me a wonderful exposure and help them to come to Yeret to defund us. And in quick time, we had this very, I would say quite a busy place with a lot of people coming here, talking hummingbirds, enjoying what I had to say, which was nice, or still nice. And I got a chance to share my photography. So I became a storyteller. Telling stories about hummingbirds. Initially, my interests was heavily biological, okay, that's my training. But it became wider and wider. And now it tells stories of all kinds of multiple wide nature, including a lot of the mythological and, and the um, yeah, mythological stuff around hum hummingbirds and the importance of hummingbirds to the indigenous people of this part of the world and what it means and so on. So I tell people these days I'm more storyteller than anything else. And I entertain my audience here by giving various stories around hummingbirds. So, and of course, we became known in the process as a place to come and enjoy wonderful meals with my wife. She suggested that we also prepare meals to serve. And that's now an essential part of what we do. So the hummingbirds became my wow of nature. Because there was so much that was exciting to me. I was like a little kid in a brand new world, an exciting new world of hummingbirds. And then I discovered something. Most Trinidadians didn't know this world existed. So in my Interaction with my guests at the year, right? I ask a question to my Trinidadian guests. And the question is a very simple question, but it helps me to understand my audience. And that question is, can you tell me? No, the question is this way. And when I ask Trinidadians and Tobagonians to tell me how many different types of hummingbirds we have in Trinidad and Tobago, what do they tell me? So I'm not asking my guests to tell me what they think. Or what did what did think Trinidadians tell me? And that is a very interesting, they give me very interesting responses. Most people try to tell me what they know rather than the question I ask. But eventually we come to the answer that most people think there's only one hummingbird in Trinidad and Tobago. And they go on to tell me with tremendous amount of confidence that a hummingbird is a hummingbird is a hummingbird. It's like way of emphasizing the point that is, what do you mean there's only one hummingbird in Trinidad? And that tells you a typical group that comes here, the challenge you have now, to take them from a place where they know very little about hummingbirds, although they would, a lot would pretend to me that they know more and they know more than me, but that's all right. And I do meet some people who know a lot more than I know, but the vast majority of people don't know. Because most people come into the world and they see hummingbirds as children, they get introduced. 
they become familiar with the Hamlet Brothers children. But they don't take much time to look at the Hamlet Brothers. And in spite of the fact that we call Trinidad the land of the Hamlet Brothers, will you believe that we don't teach about Hamlet Brothers in our schools? It's not part of our education curriculum. Even though we keep shouting Trinidad is the land of the Hamlet Brothers. That's a fine. I find amazing. At the land, in the land of the Hummingbird, we don't teach anything about Hummingbirds in the schools. Well, 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 Dr. Theo, you have to fix that. I just want to welcome uh, Christine, who has just joined us. I know she is um, going to probably stay off camera as well, but welcome, Christine. Dr. Theo had just given us the story of how he started Yaret, and he's shortly going to get into teaching us about the hundreds of different types of hummingbirds in Trinidad and Tobago. Doc, yes, we are about to make that transition. Back to you. And so I discovered that people have become adults thinking, this is the interesting part, thinking that they know about hummingbirds, but not really knowing much about hummingbirds. Now, not everybody is happy with me when I make that statement. Because, you know, our egos tend to prevent us from acknowledging the truth of who we are. But I have to, we have to work with that. I don't battle that issue. And one of the biggest challenges we have is to help people to undo what they think they know about hummingbirds. A lot of people have a lot of crazy stories about hummingbirds. And a lot of it is not correct, unfortunately, like believing that there's only one hummingbird in Trinidad. So that's where we normally start with the hummingbirds. And then we get into an exciting journey of sharing and listening to stories of people and their interaction with the hummingbird. And there are a lot of wonderful stories that people share with us. But essentially we're dealing with a little creature that is unique, one of a kind in the world. A little creature that excites people from around the world. The indigenous people of this part of the world, not just Trinidad and Tobago, saw this creature as a sacred creature, a special creature. They saw it as the souls of the dead ancestors or the spirits of the dead ancestors. And they elevated that creature into the realm of being a spiritual creature. So in seeing him as transitioning from one world to the next, from time to day, the spiritual world to the earthly world. And one of the things I also discovered when I started looking at the relationship between the indigenous people and the human bird is that all across the Americas, Wherever, well, the indigenous people all over the Americas, so I can't say wherever, but all across the Americas, from the Incas in the south to the Aztecs, to the Mayas, to the Hopis, to the Chopi Indians, all through the Americas, they saw the hummingbird as a sacred creature. And that is amazing. Which leads one to ask the next question, why? Why did the people see the hummingbirds in such a special way? Well, I hope I could share a little bit of that with you this evening. And so what I want to do now is to transition to some photographs that I have to you. And while I'm talking to the photographs, I'm going to share some information with you about how most specific information with you about hummingbirds. I think you should be seeing these birds while I talk, while That's I talk lovely. to you about them. Thank and you. And when you, I know you're anxious to see the hummingbirds. Yes, the yes. So time to get to that place. <laughs> so I'm gonna share, share. Why am I not seeing you, Wendy? Okay, so Theo, what you what you might want to do is stop the share, all right? And go back. And go back and get your pictures ready. 
and then the picture already. Well, well, right now we were seeing a few other screens, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah let's see. Yes. So make sure the pictures are exactly where you're going to go. No, no. I know. I know what happened. Okay. I um. Sorry about that. It happens. Folks, please um, bear with me a little bit. I am, in a sense, new to this ball game. All right, let me get back. <clears throat> Theo, you're not alone. <clears throat> Many people, huh? many people are new to this ball game. So take out. I'm looking for my um, my um, PowerPoint and I can't find it. And it's open on the screen. Okay, no worries. All right, I got it now. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Beautiful. All yours. All mine now. And folks, my apologies for that little um. I trust you're seeing the screen. We are seeing the screen. All right. Now on the screen. I have almost common hummingbird. This is often called a little green one. It's, a, it's the most common hummingbird that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. And you can look at the rump of the bird, and I hope you know where the rump is. And you see the copper color. And that, lead, that will tell you why it's called copper rump. But it's mostly green when you see it. And if you look where the, the legs are, you see a white little spot. It has white socks that and most people will spot this little white socks on the hummingbird. And it's wonderful, quite a photographic bird, a beautiful little hummingbird, and the most common of our hummingbirds. And here's another pretty common hummingbird that you will see. It's called the white-necked Jacobin. Look at the ray at the back of the neck. You see a little white patch there? That's what gives it the name, white-necked Jacobin. I'm going to show you better picture, uh, other pictures of these birds a, li a little bit later. And people love this little one I have on the screen now. It's one of the most iridescent birds. So let me talk about iridescent. How many birds are highly iridescent? They glow. They have a metallic finish. And they have some of the most intense colors you could find among all birds. In fact, there you was know, a time when hummingbirds were used as jewelry. Hummingbirds used to be caught in large numbers and exported to Europe, where the well-to-do woo hummingbirds as jewelry. They were used to decorate hats and corn and so on. And would you believe most of the hummingbirds came through Trinidad? And that led Europeans to make a reference to Trinidad as land of the hummingbird, although that true, ref that true name was, belongs to the indigenous people, the Amerindians. But it is that powerful, strong iridescence. And that's one of the unique things about this bird. It has, and it makes hummingbirds very appealing to human beings. And there's a color, there's, some of you may remember Peter Menchel back in 1976 and his costume of the hummingbird. This is the bird that he depicted in that costume. And you remember this color being prominent in the costume that he depicted. And not to leave Tobago out. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have 19 species of hummingbirds. And of the 19 that we have, there's one in Tobago 
That's not in Trinidad. And that's a one on the screen. Found in Tobago, but not in Trinidad. And it's a pretty large hummingbird. It's called the white tailed saber wing. And you're not going to find this hummingbird in Trinidad. So I hope at some point in time, in your next visit to Tobago, you can go looking for this bird. It's a bird of the rainforest in Tobago. This is another beautiful little hummingbird that we have here in Trinidad. It's called a white-necked Jacobin. You can see the prominent white. So it's, not a, so it's called a white-chested emerald. And you can see that white chest. And you can see the emerald color, um, which contrasts quite sharply with the whiteness. It's a beautiful hummingbird. And it's quite a common hummingbird. So many of you viewing this program will have seen this bird before. This is a much bigger hummingbird. It's called the, the black-throated mango, but this is a female feeding on a, what I call a, one of the iconic flowers for hummingbirds. Because hummingbirds feed on nectar. And they're very voracious feeders. And do you know that hummingbirds are the hungriest birds in the world? They burn more energy per unit of the body mass than any other living creatures. So they're always eating and they need to eat. If as a human being, you wanted to eat like a hummingbird, you're going to have to consume about 350 hamburgers, hamburgers in one day. That's the amount of human equivalent in terms of calories, 150,000 calories. As humans, we just burn 2,000, 2,500 calories a day. So these little birds are intense. They burn a lot of energy. Because you might have heard how fast they beat the wings. And normally in the range of about 80 to 100 times every, let me pause here, every second. And I know that sounds impossible to a lot of people listening. But that's how fast they, build, they beat the wings. And they require a lot of energy just to survive. And that's the reason why these birds have to feed so intensely. And they feed all day long because they need that energy just to survive, that cal those calories just to survive. And the hibiscus flower, of course, is an important flower providing um, nectar for the hummingbirds. Isn't this a beautiful bird? And I put, I put this, this photo into the show to show you the dramatic colors that you can get in hummingbirds. Look at that blue on the, it's, it's, a, it's, on, it's like a crest, but it doesn't lift very high. And look at the throat, we call that a gorget, contrasted with the white and other colors. This bird is called the long-billed star throat, and that's a male, beautiful little hummingbird that we have here in the country. And that's another photo of the same bird. And that gives me a little opportunity now to talk about flight. Hummingbirds, as I said, beat the wings faster than any other bird in the world, up to 200 times. They burn a lot of energy. And they defy gravity. You know, they can hover. They can appear to be stationary in the air. All of that is kind of magical stuff. And most people seeing the hummingbird in the air will not see the wings moving. The wings will be moving so fast. You can't see them, but it's the beating of the wings that keep them afloat and helps them to defy gravity altogether. And they beat the wings in a figure of eight, which is quite unique to the hummingbird. Another beautiful hummingbird of Peter Minchel fame. This is, what, this is the blue chained sapphire. An extraordinary bird that, oh, people love this bird. 
and brings a lot of joy to people who come to hear it. And now for the, our smallest hummingbird. And I want you to start by trying to imagine what two grams is like. If you have two grams in your hand, you won't even know. This bird is so tiny. It's like a letter side sheet of paper, except it's all condensed. And it weighs just over two grams. How big would it be, Theo, in terms of um, an inch or an inch and a half or two inches? How big would it be? We are metric country, Wendy. Yes, give, give us a measurement in metric. So I hope when I tell people six or seven centimeters, they can understand what I mean. Okay. All right. And, but really tiny. And this is a bird that brings visitors from all over the world to Trinidad. They come here to see this little bird because it's among the smallest birds in the world. Not the smallest, but among the smallest birds in the world. We often say the second smallest, but a range of other little birds that in that general vicinity. And here it's feeding on the lantana flower. So if you know the lantana, you get an idea of how big this bird is. Despite being a very important bird for birders coming into Trinidad, and you know, a, a lot of people come to Trinidad as nature tourists. They come to view birds and view other aspects of our nature. And this bird is an important part of our nature tourism. What is, I find this a little sad. Most Trinidadians are not even aware that this bird exists. And that's part of the, the case I want to make this evening, that we all need to get to know a little bit more about nature so we can see the wow and the magic that we have in what we, sometimes we just call it bush. And a lot of people, when they look out there, they just see bush. But in that bush are little jewels, little gems like this one. And when we get to understand what we have in the bush, we can better value and treasure the importance of nature. And I wish more people would take time to understand the importance of nature and what nature can do to you. Is the free nature really is the biggest pharmacy that we have in Trinidad? It can calm and chill us better than any medicine from the from the pharmacy. And when we understand that, well, we'll be such so much healthier people, and we'll be able to move around with a lot less stress. And little birds like this will put a light on your face, will put a smile on your face. This is our biggest hummingbird, but biggest by length. I told you that the tufted coquette is about six centimeters or so. This one can go up to 17 centimeters. And if you recognize the flower that is here, this is the Hawaiian torch or, or the torch ginger. And as you know, that's quite a big flower. And this is a beautiful hummingbird, and this is his favorite flower. We call it the green hermit. All right, another bird that can light up your day. That's my favorite. Another bird that brings visitors from around the world to Trinidad. A lot of people travel and spend a lot of money just to come here to see this bird. We have it free if we can know if we know where to look for it. We can go out into nature and we can find it. Or you could come to the earth, but they're not going to push that too hard. A beautiful hummingbird, folks. This guy is here for most of the year, but this is the only species of hummingbird that migrates to Venezuela. It goes over to the mainland every year in October. But once the parang music begins, 
in late November, this bird comes right back to Trinidad. And then it's here with us until next September. So it's our, it's our only full migrant of a hummingbird, but spectacular. I'm often asked this question, are these colors real? Well, if you look at the flower, you'll know they're real. And that's the lantana flower. And we got to get to know nature. And this is an important part of your tourism industry. People come from all over the world just to lay eye on this hummingbird that you're seeing here. Often, people often ask me a lot of intriguing questions about hummingbirds. How do they reproduce? Yeah, they seem to be so busy. Do they have time? Well, they do time. They do have time. They make time. But it's a very quick process, as you can imagine. They build nests. They lay eggs. They, raid, they take care of the young ones in the nest. And for a few of them, when the, when the young ones leave the nest, they're more or less on their own. But for some, the mother will feed them for a short while before they go off on their own. And here on the left is the baby. She looks quite big, I know. But that's the baby. And there's a mother on the left and she's feeding that baby. And she'll feed her for a a few days before she has to take care of herself. Once she, after a few days, she's on her own and she has to learn to survive on her own. And this hummingbird on the screen is a very rare hummingbird. It's called the blue-tailed emerald. The black-throated mango, a very iridescent hummingbird, strong in the interplay with light, it glows, it shines, it looks like a jewel. I showed you a female of this bird a little bit earlier. This is the male. Isn't he beautiful? That's a fantastic photograph, um, Theo, especially with the background. Soft I, I'm glad that you, you're enjoying that. Yeah. But a lot has to do with the light. Because in, in that light, he will look very different. He will look very dark. But in brilliant sunshine, he comes alive, as you can see. And you can see, you can clearly see the black throat and understand why it's called the black throated mango in this photograph. I showed you this bird earlier, the white neck jacobin, the bird that had a white patch right behind the neck. Mm -hmm. But you got a chance to see his beautiful tail now, fully displayed here. And this is one of the favorite hummingbirds of many people who come to hear it. They fall in love with this bird. They love the tail in particular. And so another beautiful hummingbird that we have here. And very easy to spot. May I ask a very question? Easy to see. Huh? Is there a huge difference between the male and female hummingbirds in terms of- In this species. In this species. But I think I have a female of this one in this, in the, in this show. I should come to it shortly. But this is the male. The black shirted mango, I just showed you the male a while ago. This is the female. Note the two white stripes coming down the front. Mm -hmm. Very different. Also a beautiful tail. People spot, tend to spot this bird very quickly because those white stripes just stand up. So the contrast between the white and the black is so strong. So people often come to me very quickly and say, what's the name of this bird with the white stripes? or they tell me the zebra stripes. Mm -hmm. That's a female black throated mango. Another photo of the white-necked Jacobin, a portrait type photo now. What, a, what, an, what an amazingly beautiful hummingbird. And there's a soothe, something that is so soothing and calm about this, I love this photo. There's a little guy, another little guy, is what, one of what we call the hermits. I showed you the great hermit just a while ago, which I said was our longest hummingbird. But this is a little guy, not as, not as long. He weighs only three grams, but a very dainty and nice looking hummingbird. This is a bird that when I have children here, they tell me he looks like a flying tadpole. 
beautiful little bird. I want to bring back the issue of iridescence. What kind of picture is that? What is he doing with his wings? He's doing a body stretch. When do you know when you wake up in the morning, you tend to do a body stretch? As you get your body in a state of readiness for the day? I can't do that. <laughs> you do it differently, but you That's do a body that. stretch. Mm. You know, when you're going to do your exercises, you do a bit of some stretching exercises before. Mm -hmm. You know, athletes routinely do stretching. Yes. But but humming, they, humming like birds, <laughs> hummingbirds routinely do the stretching as they get the bodies ready for flight. You don't beat your wings that fast and fly that fast without getting your body in a state of readiness. You know? So this is a body stretcher to get the bodies into a state of readiness for flight. Amazing little, little creatures. And this is an important part of the daily routine. And they do that many times a day as they're always in that state of readiness for action, for flight. I just thought I'd throw in this little guy. Sometimes I see beauty of a sort that's kind of look on the manager level. This bird is called the brown violet air. It's a bird of a, the higher altitudes in Trinidad and Tobago, so up in the mountains. But every now and then they come down to visit us at the lower altitudes. And then we get a chance to see the real beauty. And when he gets angry, this guy here, you see those what look like airs on the side of the bird? We call them air feathers. He pops out of their feathers to show that he's angry, to convey a message to somebody else, to some other bird, I'm not happy with you. Very aggressive birds, how many birds love a fight? And they show their, their state, their emotional state to each other. It's part of the intimidation that they do as they compete and fight among themselves for food. And you know, you heard how much food they need, a vast amount of food. Back to the ruby topaz, isn't that beautiful? That's the bird that has everybody going, wow. And as it flashes again, they say, wow, again. This is clearly part of the wow of nature. We've got a nature out there that is, has so many things that can wow us, but we have to take time to visit nature and to know what we have in nature. And we can't appreciate nature until we understand what is nature and what exists in nature. I always talk to my, my friends of the environment who talk about the importance of the environment. And I tell them one of the things that we need to do more of, don't just preach the importance of the environment, but let's, let's help people to understand nature and to understand what is in the environment. And after that, they're going to do the job for you without you telling them we need nature. Do you know how many birds are important pollinators? Mm -hmm. Major pollinators? It's not just the bees and the butterflies that are important. They are major pollinators in our world. They pollinate exclusively over 8,000 species of flowering plants. Without hummingbirds, we're in trouble. Without hummingbirds or rainforests, we're in trouble. And when people begin to understand, then people begin to understand why they must not just set about to destroy a beautiful rainforest. And why the hummingbirds are an important part of that rainforest. Another view of that, he's such a special bird, I thought I'd give you more than one view of this, this guy. He looks like a warrior. <laughs> the hummingbirds are warriors. Very, in fact, some people call them majestic warriors, beautiful birds that are always fighting. And that fighting is about competing among themselves for nectar, for food. And he's about to take off to deal with somebody who's perhaps threatening his, his source of food, his nectar or, or the feeders. May, may, I, may I add something to this, Theo? Yeah. People who have been following me know that I am I'm a, a feng shui consultant and I talk about the five elements of nature. And uh -huh. 
I've always used the hummingbird as a perfect symbol of the fire element. And when you show me this picture with this warrior hummingbird getting ready to fight and fight and fly, it taught, it, it just brought that back to me. He's such a strong well, I'm glad it, I'm glad it did. fire elements. Yeah. Yes. I'm glad it did. The world out there with the hummingbird is a very aggressive world. Mm -hmm. We love them because like the turbulent ocean, they can soothe you and calm you and relax you and help you to find yourself. But the little world in which they live is a violent world. A lot of people don't like to hear me say that. But they can be very calming and relaxing. In fact, a lot of the people who come to hear it come to enjoy the therapy of the hummingbird. In the turbulence of the hummingbird, there's a therapy that is healing and very powerful. So these are healing creatures, powerful healing creatures. And the hummingbirds also attract a lot of creative people, writers and artists and poets and writers and musicians who come seeking stimulation from the hummingbirds to help bring out their creativity. And every day at ERH, we get a number, we have great conversations with a wide range of audience. A lot of people who come here to participate in this very busy world that the hummingbirds bring into our garden. Another shot of the, of the um, white neck Jacobin. And this is a female to this bird. I told her I'd show you the female. Very different. Well, I would never have thought it was the same bird. Huh? I would never have thought it was the same species of hummingbird. Well, when you get to know hummingbirds in time, you'll get to be able to identify males and females. But some species, you can't, there's no difference. We humans can't tell the difference. But in other species, there's a dramatic difference between the males and the females. This is a bird that people love. It's a big bird, it's our biggest bird, it's cumbersome. You know, if, I don't know if you know the word, obzoki. <laughs> yes. He flies and he doesn't have the, the smoothest movements. It's a green-throated mango. He weighs 8.5 grams, the largest hummingbird bird by weight that we have in our garden. Is normally a bird of the mango swamps that can carry it. But an amazing bird. Beautiful hummingbird. And you see the green throat. I call it the traffic light bird. I only see him from a distance. We just see the green on the throat like a traffic light inviting you in. That's a black throat mango. And you can see the black on the throat here. And he's in the rain. Hummingbirds love the rain. I don't have time to tell you how they do that, but they love the rain. Another one of the ruby topaz, beautiful in the rain. Another look. As Stunning. I told you, they're aggressive birds. They love the fighting. As beautiful as they are. And here's a male and female fighting. They fight all comers, whether whether they are females or males, the same species, other species. It's a, war, it's a wall of war when it comes to hummingbirds. It's all about trying to keep the food for themselves. It's a kind of selfish act, so they fight each other. That's the Peter Minchel hummingbird, the costume that people so admire, mm -hmm. the blue chain sapphire. In the rain here, they, I told you again, they love water. And go back to the smallest of them all, the ruby topaz. Isn't he amazing? No, the coquette. That's so often I'm a... That's a tough coquette, yeah? Is, does he exist? Well, you've got to get to get into nature. Go and look for him. The wow of nature, Wendy. And that's the I showed this one to you earlier, the brown violet, and I go back to the Robito Violet, okay? Such, there's the in traffic with the 
what are the most important flower for hummingbird? It produces a vast amount of nectar. And most people trying to attract hummingbirds will try to get some of this plant in their garden. And every morning you can be sure of every day of the year, this plant would produce a new crop of flowers loaded with nectar for the hummingbirds. Absolutely amazing little bird that we have here. Now, before I leave, I just one final comment I want to make. I told you earlier that we don't teach much about hummingbirds. But we teach nothing about hummingbirds. I've been working for some time trying to interest the Ministry of Education to make Trinidad really the land of the hummingbird and to get the hummingbird into the curriculum. I have not succeeded. And I hope somebody is going to be listening to this program who can help us to do that. Because the people of this country need it. The children need it. And also, and this is past my, one of my final points I want to make is, <laughs> these days we are spreading the message that there are two national birds in Trinidad and Tobago. That is not so. At independence, if you go back to listen to the address of the first prime minister of this country, when he introduced the coat of arms to the country, he made reference to the three birds on the coat of arms as the national birds of Trinidad and Tobago. But somewhere along the line, we have forgotten about the Hammond birds. And we are now erroneously preaching a message that there are only two national birds in Trinidad and Tobago. That is wrong. And given the importance of the hummingbird, and given that the hummingbird is the most used hummingbird, we use the hummingbird as a national symbol more than any other national symbol in this country. You know, more than any other. I think it is time that we correct that. And we bring, give the hummingbird its rightful place as a national bird of Trinidad and Tobago. And Wendy, if you can join us in helping to spread that message and bring in that change, then my presence here to, on your show this evening will have been worth it. Yo, thank you so much. Could you stop the share now, even though I love that hummingbird? That's my favorite hummingbird of all. But stop the share so we can, we can see your, your face um, bigger. Yes. And Terry and Christina here. Uh, you, know, you never know when you, when you expose yourself where you have today, where that journey will take us, who will see the video, who will respond. This is the, you know, every time you do this, you are opening that opportunity, those doors. So thank you, don't, you know, go in faith on that. I would like to ask if Terry or Christine have any questions for you. Okay. Christine, this is Ms. Dr. Theodore Ferguson. And you, I, I believe you've met Christine many years ago. I'm told I met you, Christine, so. Yeah. And I really hope so. Have you got any questions? I can't see yeah. enough of you to make that decision now, but tell me, what is it? How can I, how can I respond to your question? No, I actually don't have a question. I just... Um, yes, I, I know you. I actually have a comment. Um, many, many years ago when I visited Yeret, I was really impressed with the birds and um, just your passion for these in tiny creatures. And today that has been repeated. The birds are stunning. Your photography is incredible. And definitely these, these images need to be on show, um, I don't know, everywhere. And, um, you know, I just think that your, your, your life has been spent honoring these birds and it's really a testimony to 
um, that passion and that purpose that and we've been able to see it today. Thank you so much. Christine, and also the patience, because I'm sure every single photograph um, involved hours and hours of waiting for the right position, lighting, moment. And so the, the, the dedication and the love have, have shown. Yeah. I believe that every, as I said, every, every, every opportunity is possible for you. Just, we just have to have the right people hear your message. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 we will believe that this may be one of those ways that you, through this exposure to the tribe, new things will come your way. Terry, do you have any comments or questions for the doc? Um, I don't have any questions. I, I would have had a comment, but Christine um, summed up everything I wanted to say so beautifully. So um, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, Dr. Ferguson's passion definitely shone through. And I learned, I learned a lot um, about these tiny creatures that I happen to share my environment with because where I am in Tobago, it's at the back of the, um, I'm situated at the back of the Grafton Bird Sanctuary. So uh, there are lots, and there's a beautiful garden here. So lots and lots of, of hummingbirds. And I came to learn from being in this environment that they are aggressive and warriors. I didn't know that before. So it was nice to have that uh, because it was kind of shocking uh, to have the experience. And um, so it was nice to, to get some information on them and some more information on, on how they meet and um, generally just um, how they go about life. And I would like to say something, Doc, because we are now, I know you have, you do have people waiting for you and we are on time. The, um, the, the images that you have shown, I do believe, and some of the ones that you show on your Facebook page, they should be worldwide, international, all over the airport, in, you know, in the schools, at the exhibitions, because they are those, that's the kind of uh, images, imagery you have, and the stories that you want to tell should be part of it. So, I mean, I would love very much to see that. I, 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 um, Wendy, could I ask you a question? Yes. Are you willing to be part of that, sharing it out? Who knows? I'm doing, I'm doing what I can right now, and who knows? Because this is how it gets done. Yes, this is how it gets done. All right. It, who it knows takes teamwork road... and other people. Yeah. And let me tell you, the day we bring the hummingbirds into our schools, everything transforms. Okay. So in, with and have, have we have to get into our schools, and we have to get the hummingbird recognized for what it is, a national bird of Trinidad and Tobago. Let's stop hiding it in the background. And, and Dr. Theo, I think your imagery can go a large, long way towards making that happen because you stop traffic with your story, you stop traffic with your passion, you stop, you stop traffic with your photographs. We're going to have to call it um, a wrap today. I want to give thanks to all of you. We had several people come in, come in and out on the Facebook Live, and I hope that they enjoyed it as much as we did who are here present with you on Zoom. Dr. Ferguson, many thanks for all that you have done and all that you are doing and all that you will do. Terry and Christine, thank you for joining us. And, and, and I look forward to, of course, seeing you again soon. All right, many, many blessings. Thanks for the opportunity. You're most welcome.